Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of uh, bike share in London, um, and we're basically going to be trying to predict the number of bikes used, which is this number count, um, based on a bunch of features about the bike share or about the day uh, for a given date and time. So I think this goes by the hour. We're going to basically be guessing, um, predicting in a given hour how many bikes were used based on the like weather on the certain day. Um, all right, so let's hop into the notebook. Uh, we're going to be using NumPy and Pandas for working with the data. I'm going to do a little visualization using Plotly Express. Um, and then for a pre-processing, we'll use the train test split function and standard scalar from sklearn. For predictions today, we will be using an XGB regressor model from XGBoost. Let's go ahead and import all of that and load in the data using pandas.readcsv. So we can grab the CSV file path up here. I'm going to go ahead and copy that, paste it in here, and we can take a look. So here's the data set we saw on the other page. So um, we're going to try to pre predict the count column based on the other columns. Let's check data.info to get a little more information. And it looks like there are no missing values. We also have a good number of rows, 17,000. Um, so let's get into the pre-processing. We have one object column, that's just the timestamp column, which actually is just numeric variables all stored in one column. So what we're going to do is extract the features out of that column, put them in their own columns. So let's create this function preprocess inputs that takes in the data frame and makes a copy of it. That's all it will do for now. But this is the, uh, sorry, return df. This is the copy that we'll do the preprocessing on. So we'll pass in data here and get back x. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is probably deal with this timestamp column since we saw there's no missing values. Um, so the information in this timestamp column is year, month, day, and hour. You can see the hour changes, but the minute and second uh, is not encoded. So I actually don't want to use year, and the reason is um, I would want to build a model that can predict the number of bikes used uh, in the future. And using the year, uh, if it's always being used on future data, uh, then the year is not useful because the, the model will not have seen uh, data from the future, if that makes sense. The year is a measure of recency, and since the model is always going to be used on the most recent information, uh, knowing what year it is doesn't actually help. Uh, so, if we wanted to build a model that could predict uh, the number of, of uh, bikes used at some time in the past, then the model would be useful, uh, then keeping the year would be useful. But um, I'm approaching this problem under the assumption that I'm using this model for the future, so we're not going to use the year column. However, month, day, and hour are all useful, so I'm going to extract those features. Let's say extract month day and hour features from the timestamp column. So how we'll do this is we'll take the column and we'll just convert it to a date time column using pandas.2 date time. Uh, and that allows us to then go into the column and apply a function to it. Uh, that maps every x here, and x is a given timestamp, to x.month. And x.month, as long as this is a daytime object, uh, which is what we're doing up here, x.month will just extract the month data and store it as an integer. So this will actually create the month data. So what I'll do is create a new column now called month that just uses those values. Sorry, it should be a df sub month. All right, so if we look at this now, you can see we've pulled the month out, and the month corresponds to this here. I uh, just want to make sure that we're, we have unique values. All right, and you can see we have all 12 months in this column. All right, and we'll do the same thing for uh, day and hour. So this is day and hour. Just change the change these to day and down here change these to hour. And when we're done, uh, we can drop the original timestamp column. 
since we took out all the information we want. Dropping from axis one, and you can see we have month, day, and hour now, and the original uh, timestamp is gone. All right, so now all of our data is in numeric form, and we want to predict the count column using the rest. However, before we proceed, proceed, we have to take note that even though it's in numeric form, there are actually categorical variables present, uh, namely the weather code column and the season column. Actually, season is sort of debatable. Weather code, certainly. Weather code, these are all independent values. They're codes. They represent some state of the weather, um, but it's not meant to be interpreted as a continuous variable. For example, a weather code of 1 is not necessarily less than a weather code of 4. So we want to one-hot encode this column. So we use pandas.getDummies to do this. Um, so x sub weather code. That will send each unique value to its own column. And a 1 represents the original value of that example. So all the rest will be zeros. So here we have a 1, 1, 1 in 3, 1, 1. Over here, that's 3, 1, 1. That's why we see that. We can also include a prefix. Let's call it weather. And that will just put the name, the prefix at the beginning of each column name so that we know where these columns are originally coming from. So uh, the reason I was saying that season is debatable is because assuming the seasons go in order, let's look at this. I'm not sure the actual encoding of it. Maybe zero is winter, one is spring, two is summer, three is fall. As long as they're in order, this is actually a valid ordinal feature because they are equally spaced. So this spacing between the values is, is valid. Um, it is a cycle. So in this situation, what I'd probably do is um, try out both encoding schemes, both leaving it as it is as an ordinal feature and then also uh, trying it as a one-hot feature like this and seeing which gives us better performance. Um, it's not always clear-cut which uh, method to use, so it's good to try them out both. For this video, I'll keep it as ordinal, um, and I'll just one-hot encode this weather column. So let's one-hot encode the weather code column. So we're going to create our dummies. Let's call them weather dummies. And we get that with pandas.getDummies for the column. Uh, and we'll give it a prefix of weather. Uh, and then we will take those, those dummies and uh, put them on to, the, to our original data frame. So we'll use pandas.concat, concatenating the original DF and the new weather dummies. Uh, and we want to put them side by side, so axis one. Then we'll go and drop the original weather code column, since we no longer need, uh, we extracted all the information from it. Column is not defined. Oh yeah, sorry, this should not be column. It should be weather code. All right, now you can see we have all of our weather codes on the end here, and all the rest of the data is still present. All right, so we've encoded everything, no missing values. Let's go and split DF into X and Y. So y is going to be the, the column we're trying to predict. Here, that's the count column right here. And then x is all the rest of the data. So let's drop the count column from axis 1. And now we have two sets of the data. We'll then do the train test split. So this will create x train, x test, y train, and y test. And we'll use the train test split function from sklearn to do this. We'll just pass in x and y, give it a train size, this could be 70%, so we'll send 70% to the train set, the other 30% to the test set. Keep shuffle equals true, so that will shuffle the data before making the split, and give it a random state to ensure the shuffle is always done in the same way. And let's go ahead and, and uh, return these four values, get them back over here, and then take a look at x train. So we no longer have the count column, uh, and we also have 70% of the data here. So let's look at Y train. This should just be our labels. I mean our target values. So this is count. These are the count, the number of bikes used on a given day. Last thing to do is scale the data. So scale X. Um, we'll use a standard scaler. 
Uh, and now I'm not actually, I don't think we need to use a scaler here because we're using XGBoost, which by default uses um, trees and tree-based models don't need scaling. However, I'm st it doesn't uh, inhibit the performance, so I'm going to scale anyway in case we wanted to substitute it with another um, another model. So scalar.fit on xtrain. We only fit on the train set, so we want to pretend we don't have access to the test set at the time of pre-processing. And then we'll overwrite xtrain with a scaled version of it. So scalar.transform xtrain. Only thing is this transform function does return a numpy array. So Let's go and turn it back into a data frame afterwards and keep the indices as they were and the column names as they were. We'll go and copy this, paste it here, and just do the same thing for xtest. So we fit on xtrain and we transform both xtrain and xtest. Oh, and scaling, the reason to scale is uh, right now all of the, the range of values in each column is different. And uh, other models, not, not the tree-based models, but many models uh, do improve their performance substantially when every column has the same range of values. So the standard scaler does a shift in scale to give every column a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. You can see that here. Now they all are centered at 0, and most of their values will lie between negative 1 and 1. Okay. So let's start training. We're going to create the model. This is an XGB regressor from XGBoost, and we'll fit the model on the train set, X train, Y train. That's pretty much it for training. I'm not going to do hyperparameter optimization uh, today. Let's just get the results. Okay, so for the results, we want to get some predictions, which I'll call Y pred. We'll just get that with model.predict X test. So Ypred looks like this, just a set of predictions. And we can compare them to Ytest, which are the true values, to see how far off we are. So we want a sort of a metric to understand like how bad our predictions are on are average. So we can do that by taking the error, which would be x Ytest minus Ypred. And this is the error for each example. Um, now we could take the average error, but there'd be a problem. We have positives and negatives in here. So if we add them up and divide by the number of examples, we'd actually, uh, the positives would cancel out the negatives. Um, so we can, uh, we can work around this by squaring the result. So this is the squared errors, and now they're all on the positive scale. We then can take the mean, or average, and we get the mean squared error. Uh, only problem here is that our, our, the unit of this uh, result is in squared number of bikes because we squared the, the result. So we take the square root then to return it to just the unit number of bikes and so here it is this is called the root mean squared error or RMSE and this is saying we're on average we're 214 bikes off every prediction. Which if you look um, some of these are up into the thousands. Let's look at ytrain.describe to get a sense of the distribution. So a minimum of 0, maximum of 7800 uh, 7, with the median at 838. So that's fairly good. I mean, get being 200 bikes off in this context is decent, right? Um, you know, not, not fantastic, but also not, not too bad. So let's, uh, why don't we find the R squared score also? So uh, the R squared score is a measure of how much better your model is than the baseline model. The baseline model is, well, we just had Y test available to us, no X's, no inputs, no model at all. How could we create a model that could work, uh, could make the best predictions possible use, given only the targets? And the obvious answer is just predict the mean every time. We just predict this value every single training example, that would be the baseline model. So if we find the error for that, ytest minus ytest.mean, here are the errors for the baseline model. If we square them like we did before, and then take the sum instead of the mean, just sum up, this will be the sum of squared errors for the baseline model. Uh, it's quite big, uh, but let's now compare this to our model. So we take our model, which is ypred, 
uh, take the errors, square that, and then take the sum. This is our sum of squared errors, and we can compare them to each other uh, via a fraction, a ratio. So we'll put our errors on the numerator and the baseline errors on the denominator, um, and this will uh, have the effect of becoming zero when we have zero error, uh, or when our error is much smaller than the baseline error. This thing goes to zero. And when our error is much larger than the baseline error, this whole thing goes to positive infinity. All right, as our error approaches positive infinity, the whole fraction does. So um, this is OK, but it's not as interpretable as if we do 1 minus this. Because that says, uh, if we have zero error, then this whole fraction goes to zero, and one minus zero becomes one. So the best possible score we can get is one when we have zero error. And on the other hand, if we have a really bad error, if we have like, well, let's assume it goes to positive infinity. As our error goes to positive infinity, this whole fraction goes to positive infinity. And one minus positive infinity is negative infinity. So that's the R squared score. Um, and it has the effect of uh, being 1 when you have 0 error and negative infinity when you have really, really bad error. Obviously, it never reaches negative infinity, but you get the idea. So we end up with an R-squared score of 0.96, which is saying, essentially, we have 96% reduction in total error from, our, from uh, the baseline model to our model. And that's fairly good. Um, so the, the RMSE is sort of a measure of how your model is doing in an absolute sense, meaning in the context of the task we're performing. Uh, we get it back, we get an error in the unit of the actual task, of the actual uh, target variable. So this is number of bikes. The R squared score is a, a relative metric. It, it, it compares your model to another model and tells you how much better yours is than that one. So let's uh, compare these, sorry, not compare them, just put them in the same block and print them out. So RMSE, uh, we'll display this to two decimal places as a percentage and format with RMSE. Um, not a percentage, sorry, just, just like that. Okay, then we'll print out the R squared score. And we'll display this one to four decimal places, formatting with R2. All right, last thing I'd like to do is uh, plot the predicted values against the actual values. So let's create a new plotly express figure with px.scatter to make a scatter plot. And on the x, let's plot the, the predicted values, ypred. And on the y, we'll plot the actual values, ytest. We'll give it some axis labels. We'll put the x axis to predicted, and the y axis will become actual. And we'll give this a title, which will be actual versus predicted values. Last thing I want to do is just give the chart a uh, width and height. I'll give 700 for each. All right, and we'll show. Okay, so we see the RMSE, the R squared, and then this is the plot of actual versus predicted values. Now for this plot, you want uh, most of the values to look like this, like on this Y equals X line. This means that your predicted values are equal to your actuals. Uh, the more dispersed the data, the data points are around this Y equals X line, uh, the worse your model is performing. In general, it looks like our model is doing fairly well. Uh, there's not too much dispersion here. Um, and that can be gauged by the RMSE and the R squared. I mean, uh, this model can probably still be improved. I think we didn't do any hyperparameter optimization or model selection, so there's probably room for improvement. Um, but yeah, in general, it's a fairly good model. Uh, and that will sum up today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.